What's up, everybody? Chris Fluck here. This is the Chris and Friends podcast with my number one friend, my other half, Marisa Mangiamelli. Now, before we get into this, I just want to explain something. The Chris and Friends podcast is going to be about, uh, you know, just been doing stuff in the health and or coaching world for like 10 plus years. Mm-hmm. Met a lot of people. I think I meet a lot of educated people that um, I seem to always have these good conversations with, but you don't get to see them as often. You don't get to like sit down or just have a basic conversation with an hour. The podcast is going to be about that. We're going to try to get together with some people that I've met over the years. Yeah. Get caught up. It's not work, but it's going to kind of give us a way to get together, make an excuse to <laughs> block out an hour of your time. If you heard a bark, that's our huge puppy, Queenie. She's a great dame. She just turned one year old. Now, on to Marisa here. So, how you doing today? I'm good. good. How are you? How does it feel to be the first guest? <laughs> honored. I'm yeah. honored to be the first guest. And now, to be acknowledged as your number one number friend. Number one friend yeah. slash other half, that's... Marisa. That's pretty good. <laughs> we probably spend the most time together. I think you got the number one spot for... Uh, you think so? Indefinitely, we'll say. Forever. Uh, yeah. Indefinitely. Hopefully. I don't know. I hope so. Which one sounds better. But uh, <laughs> So last night, we have to start with something because... Um, oh gosh, you, you started claim... with the... <laughs> here, this is it. There's a, there's a book right here. We're going to start with Christopher's poor track record in movies, I think, is what's happening. This is it. It's probably backwards. You can't see. Killers of the Flower Moon. No, it won't be backwards, I don't think. Perfect. The Osage <laughs> Murders and the Birth of the FBI. I read this book three to five years ago. Recently, I'm on a kick about... The 1800s, okay? I read the Abe Lincoln biography. Mm -hmm. Great. All right? Doris Kearns, good one. Incredible. Civil War, slavery, all that stuff's going on. Then I dive into this book about, not this one, but a different one about the American Indian. And uh, then I realized that these time, these periods in time overlap. So uh, Empire of the Summer Moon was about the Comanches. And while that's going on, the Texas Rangers are formed. The Rangers are formed to kind of go out there and hunt the American Indian. Then the Civil War kicks in. A lot of those soldiers that were stationed out there had to go battle in the war, basically. Mm-hmm. So there was like a small reprieve in that, and then they come back. So that's like the 18, you know, 50 to 60 range. Prior to that, American Indians are just getting kicked off their land. One president, James Monroe, was like, from sea to shining sea, they wanted to spread mm-hmm. from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Yeah, from They started Atlantic. doing that. They took it, building the railroad, all of that stuff, right? Um, which leads me to what kind of kick-started the interest in the American Indian. This book, Killers of the Flower Moon. I learned about this stuff. Yeah. The Osage Indians, all right? They're in Kansas. They get run out of Kansas. They give them, they basically get given um, what they deem native territory or something like that in Oklahoma. Turns out it's a mountainous region. There's not much going on there. You can't get a whole lot going, but. There's lots of oil. They strike oil. Yeah. This was totally unintended, um, and it became the richest county per capita in the world, I think is what it said. Yeah. So I read this book. It's awesome. David Graham wrote it. And then at the time of this reading, I'm, uh, this is three or four years ago, I'm like, they're making a film. This is incredible. This is three to four years of hype that I've been waiting for this movie to come out. I check it out three and a half hours. I'm like, huh, that's a long movie. He's been asking to watch the movie for months. Then we watch it. And... For how long do you think we stared at the TV <laughs> wondering what in the world is going on here? How long? At least 60 minutes. More, most of the movie. Holy smokes. We just started watching and we had no idea what was going on, where it was going. Leonardo DiCaprio's <laughs> in it. All right. I read the book. I see the cast. DiCaprio. De Niro. Yeah. Who good else? Cast. Who else? John Lithgow makes an appearance at the end as a lawyer. That's right. Brendan Fraser's in that thing at the end. All right. He is? He's the big heavy dude that was... Uh, what? Hale's... Attorney. Really? Yes. Wow, he was big. Um, he's a big dude now. I don't know <laughs> if that was for the role or not, but yeah, anyway. Grade the movie. Oh my gosh. Keep in, keep in mind, Rotten Tomatoes, which is a great site. No. At least it used to be. No. Gave it like a 90-something by no. the critics. And 84, it said 84% of the audience liked it. I'd like, I didn't like 84% of the movie. Rotten Tomatoes has steered us, well, steered Christopher wrong. Like wrong, a hundred percent rate. Maybe. Imagine no, <laughs> yes. no. The first time I ever used that. So this imitation game. <laughs> imitation game. We went game to go see the imitation. Yeah, game. imitation game was really good. That was okay, like a I'll ninety-eight or something. I'll give you that. All right. Okay, but it's okay. So yeah, ninety-eight percent fail rate. Well, it started. Um, it started great. It started. I don't know, the movie, I also didn't think was great. The story is is 
dark. Oh, man. It's a dark, sad story, which he loves. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very opposite there. Absolutely. But um, I was intrigued by it. Like, basically, after the movie, I wanted to learn more. And the movie definitely could have provided more. So uh, at the end of it, it's like, you know, there's 25 known, I think, murders that, that occurred over the short period of time. Crazy. So basically, this is, I guess the premise is this. There's, they strike oil randomly. They become the richest um, county per capita, but... Really, it was one man. It was like one man that orchestrated a whole bunch of death. True. To try to, to, well, to capitalize on the land. It was one man. Don't know if we want to ruin it or not, so we'll try not to. <laughs> But anyway, there's an Indian. Uh, there's there's the American Indians are out there. The Native Americans, they're there. They need a white person basically to grant them permission to get access to their funds. And I forget the term that they used for that person. They it's a guardian a, or something. Yeah, they needed basically a guardian. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't even access their money. They charged the Indians. Gross. Businesses just came up, right? And they would charge Osage prices where, you know, a $500 thing became $2,500 because the Osage had the money to do it. So they strike oil. Then there's these head rights involved where you get rights to these to these lands. By well, the doing Osage it, inherently had rights to the land. Yes. So they had the head rights. The head, the head rights were the head for the he oil heads. So, I mean, it's right, like any other land. estate situation here where, you know, somebody passes, the estate gets moved to whatever, next of kin, a child, a husband, whatever mm -hmm. it may be. Yeah. So a lot of white individuals in the movies portrayed as white males start marrying the native, the Osage women. Mm -hmm. um, but things get a little crazy then because people start dying these slow deaths or there's just straight out, uh, just outright murder going on. Yeah. So the movie goes for like at least two thirds of the way, but then the birth of the FBI is also kind of intertwined with this and Jager, Hoover. Yeah, but the movie didn't really there. touch on that at all. No, it was only 30 or maybe 45 Like, there's so much minutes. more to the story that yeah. the movie did not encompass. So, if you're actually interested in the story, read the book. Yeah. Don't watch read the Read the book. <laughs> yeah. That's that. At the end of that, we get a phone call. Our daughter's not home. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Marisa had a moment as a parent where... Many moments we, we, as a parent. We got snow yesterday here, and it wasn't really all that bad. No. Three to five inches, maybe. But we told Emmy, our daughter, like, hey... You're going to my parents, her known and pop pop's house. Well, to be clear, she wanted her? to go. Yes. We didn't tell her she was going. She wanted to go. She asked if she could go. And then I we said to her, Well, you can go, but if you go, you'll have to sleep over. Because at that time we didn't know how much snow we were gonna get. And uh we so like she has um She not, hasn't been sleeping over. She has not stayed anywhere. <laughs> she basically is with us twenty four seven when she's not at school and even there, Chris is there three days a week. So um, cause he's a PE teacher there and she yeah, gets yeah. to see him. So, um, yeah, so we've been trying to encourage her to sleep over with her Nona and Pop Pop, which is Chris's parents for a while, which she hasn't done for, I don't months. even know, months, months, if not a year. Yeah. It's been a really long there time. There was a time where she stayed there two nights in a row, um, previously, but then short stretch of time had these like, you know, little cyclical phases where she was in and she was out, but previous moments of, I want to go home. She came home and it was like, okay. It was tough, right? Yeah. I mean, she's crying. It's hard for my parents. Like, it's easier for them to they just... They don't have a tough shell. It's easier for them to just say, all right. We <laughs> she should... cries and they're like, okay, what do you yeah. want? But Let's last go night, get that. The decision was made. Sorry, no, no. Yesterday. <laughs> the decision was made. Yeah. So you're staying there. And she called. And Marisa, right before we watched yeah. that wonderful movie. <laughs> yeah, it was right before the movie, actually. I can't get this yeah, it was before the movie. Back. Three and a half. Three and a half hours, too. Bill Maher, I listen to him. His podcast is funny. He's like, if you can't wrap up a movie in 90 minutes, he's like, I would have to done. agree with that. And they could have told that story in like a crazy chaotic way, I think. And, and they missed so many good things. Like they missed so many details that would but, have been really in intriguing and interesting. That It was a real life story. So, I mean, they should have really given well, it more. Let's but, get back to the parenting. Yeah, back to Emmy. Back okay. to the parenting tip here. <laughs> Risa had a, a moment of sadness. Because... Well, I was half naked getting in the shower, which I don't often get to do by myself also. So there was that piece of it. I was about to get in the shower and I got a FaceTime from, of information from Emmy. Who cares? It's the truth. <laughs> Lots of moms can relate to that. Um, Emmy's FaceTiming me and she's crying because she wants to come home. And I said, well, Em, we talked about this before you left. I, because I knew, I knew like that she, that, that this was going to happen. So we had multiple talks about it before she left about how it was snowy outside and the roads might not be safe for us to get her or for pop up and Nona to bring her home. And so she had the plan to stay over and she said, okay, I want to bring the dogs. So she brought Leela and Rufus. We obviously have Queenie 
and um, then she wanted to come home. <laughs> And so it was, it was hard. I tried, but it, I mean, I, I stayed calm and just talked to her and I said, peanut, we, we made a decision and, uh, the roads aren't safe to drive. And, uh, if you want me to read you some books, I'll do that. We talked about that for a little bit. She said, no, I don't want to compromise. <laughs> she was screaming that she wanted to come home. It got to the point where she was actually screaming and not crying. She was like angry, she was angry, yelling. And I just said, I hear what you're saying to me. I understand you want to come home, but we're not going to do that tonight. So then I said to her that I wasn't going to talk about um, her coming home, but that I would be happy to talk about a compromise, like us reading books to her via FaceTime. And she didn't want to talk about that. So I said, okay, well, then I'm going to get off the phone. And if you want to call back because he wants to read you some books, we can do that. And she said, okay. And she got sad and said bye to me. We hung up. And then... She never called for reading books, so. No, no. <laughs> apparently just fell asleep. And here we are, still childless, so. And she Success. fell asleep and woke up and has been fine. But <laughs> it was a tough moment. It was. It made me sad. I was sad last night, too. Yeah, and at some point, I mean, I was. she is only five, so it's like. Yeah. Obviously, the having the foresight to be like 12 hours from now, I have to stay true to my word. That word might already been forgotten at that point. I mean, we probably, you probably brought up the conversation and she was like, yeah, I might have said that, but I still want to come home. <laughs> yeah, she totally so remembered to our conversation. Way to yeah. like have her, she um, said she changed her mind. I know, but I changed her, my mind is what she said. Like what me. she says matters, right? And trying to have her yeah. understand that whatever agreements are made, like mm -hmm. we're going to stay true to that. But then um, somehow keep in mind that she is five at the moment. I know. So that's what I said to you. Because I was feeling guilty and sad, and Chris was like, it's okay, she's okay. And I was like, I know, but she's just five. Yeah, and d develop some resiliency, I guess, here. A little oh, bit. my gosh. Know. <laughs> Who knows? Anyway, let's move on here. So who's Marisa? That's what I want to know. That's what the people want to know. I, Who is Marisa? I don't know, Chris. How would how would you answer that question? It's, uh, I'm not answering it. I'm asking you. You said I'm the host. <laughs> Well, it is your podcast. Yeah, so what is it? Who are you? Who, who you am do? I? That's yeah, a, what do you do? Uh, who am I and what I who do are, are not you? the same thing. Who have you been mm. and who are you now? That's like a... Well, let's just talk about work stuff. What do you do? <laughs> you got a phone. All right, all right work stuff here, is This different. is a room. You see this room we're in? We have books yeah. in the back. Lots of books. Built oh in the 1900s, this room, right? We have so many books. Yeah, this is... Yes, this is the original part of the house, so it is old. Old farmhouse. 1700s, probably. Why are we on a farm yeah. right now? How did you find a farm, I guess? What what kind of profession brought you into the farming world? Well, I mean, the true story is I actually didn't want to live here. <laughs> but, well, I, but I have an ex-husband <laughs> who, who moved here. Um, and then I fell in love with the farm and he hated it. So that's how I had the farm. But, but why I, need a farm? Well, I was a lifelong equestrian. Mm, and had What's that? An, <laughs> um, had an equestrian business for 22 years. So what, which is what, though? What are you doing? What were you, who are you teaching primarily? Um, I'd say mostly young adults to adults was my clientele for 20 plus years. And the goals for these individuals were ranging from what to what? Like, I just want to learn how to ride to competing at a high level or? Um, mostly competing. Yeah? Yeah. So you didn't really want to do beginner stuff or? No. Anything like that, you... I actually did... I love beginners that actually want to... Um, I love just the progression of learning. Mm. So whether it's the horse or the rider, um, as long as there's like... There's enjoyment in the process. So I, I actually do love beginners that really love to learn. But um, like doing... Teaching children was never my thing because a lot of times it's their parents that want them to ride. Or, or a little girl... You know, every little girl wants to ride a pony or have a pony and... Yeah. And that's not like, um, their engagement is low. That's like, I don't do well with that. I would never be a good, like elementary school teacher. What about like a phys ed teacher? You think <laughs> no. Um, I actually like the opposite of you, which is surprise, surprise, huh? But anyhow, um, so what, what were you just saying there? You had the, uh, you didn't want to do the beginner too, too much unless they were totally engaged trying to. I, l I did love something. beginners that actually wanted to learn, that enjoyed the experience of learning. And having, working towards something, right? Yeah, working towards something. So sure. instead of just having a joy ride, you know, once a month. Yes, joy right. rides, not my jam. Now, um, so, man, I just forget what I was just going to ask. 
Oh, the horse, the connection, right? You said every little girl likes to, um, or has this idea about riding ponies. Yeah. Why? Why? We have the books. It's usually driven towards young girls. We go to a horse show. You might have judged a horse show, right? Yeah, lots of horse shows. 99 out of 100, are, if it's younger kids. In the United States. 90 to 10. 90 to 10, we'll say. No. Yeah, in the United States. No, no, I'm it's, saying if there's 50 kids countries. there, there's probably not five boys. Like a yeah, there's small, at least five boys. All right, so let's just say it's a small horse show for younger kids, 45 out of 50, or probably female, 90%, right? Yeah. In America, that's how it goes. In the United States, that's how it is. In other countries, it's not. All right. What's the connection? It, not necessarily in America, but there's like a, there seems to be some sort of... Well, I mean, there's a connection to horses with humans throughout history. That's a good point. You know, it, there's... I'm trying to find the female, the young girl, and the pony connection. I think if that... It exists, even. Um, There's no fear. Like, I had fear. We have this horse, Oreo, oh, who's huge. Granted, I was like 28. The first time I was around him, I was like, oh. Granted, I was an adult, so maybe I had these fears in my mind that like a young kid doesn't have. But Emmy was like walking as a two-year-old, three-year-old, just kind of out there hanging out, yeah. wanting to go in the stalls. I never had an interest. Like, this is the first time in my life where I feel like I could go in there and I would clean a stall if needed to be done, and I wouldn't. But Emmy, I wouldn't want to move the horse out first. Emmy was literally raised with it. You know, I don't think that's... I think little kids are scared, too. I Like, they're, they're very attracted to the animals, but I think they also are aware of their size. There's lots of kids that, that think they really want to ride. Mm -hmm. Like, we've had some of them here. They're yeah. like, oh, I, like, I want a pony ride. I want a pony ride. And then when it comes time to actually get on the pony, it's like, hard stop, no. Hmm. Because they're afraid of it. But Emmy literally grew up, like... So, so Emmy, Emmy about... grew up around the horse. Like I, I, so I don't have my equestrian business anymore. I do integrative health, which I've been doing on and off for We're gonna years. We're going to get to but, that. That's part of but, uh, who is Marisa. Right. But Emmy literally grew up on my back out in the barn. I mean, I wore her and taught lessons. My first time, I think she was uh, not quite two months old outside. I mean, she was at a horse show. She was at a horse show. She was only a few weeks old. Right. She was born in March. We had regionals. Yeah, she was at her first horse show. She was three weeks old. So she's her exposure is so different. I And and she's... Yes, yeah, so I, I don't want to talk about her then because yeah. of that. Because it is a unique experience. I think there's just an attraction think to the animals. A, I think don't... there's something spiritually... That's more female-based than male? I mean, No. I think little boys are attracted to them too. It's yeah, just... Uh, uh, that, that's... Yeah, attracted is one thing. But like, I don't know. I think there's some sort of connection that might exist that I don't Do, know about. You know what it is? It's it's a cultural thing, like especially in the the like yeah. hunter jumper sport that which is what I do because there's this like cultural perception of a man in tights, and so like most guys you don't think there's a lot of dads? most guys don't yeah most guys don't want their little boys wearing what tights I mean they're not tights they're do you called think birches dads but want to do it or no no you're right now in other That's countries correct. in other countries it's a it's like um, a renowned profession. So it's a like a well-respected profession. Is the Olympics? It's a well-respected industry. And actually, there's a tremendous amount of males. And, and even at the top level in our country, it's it's predominant. It's, it's, it's at least 50% males. The Olympic level is co-ed when they compete? Yeah, it's, it's male versus yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah. I no, it's okay. So I really think it's a cultural thing. Uh, that it's more girls maybe that do it than... It is. I think every little kid is attracted so a, to animals. More girls are getting exposed to it for sure. For a hundred percent, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And I coached Lehigh for twenty-two years. This is my last year coaching, and Lehigh I and really I'm just in an advisory role this year. Yeah. Yeah. Advisor. Advisor to my my mentee, my my successor. Is that the right word? Successor, yeah. Yeah, to my successor. Cool. Patrice um, Kane, she's awesome. So you had a, um, you had a pot, you had not a podcast. You had a farm. <laughs> we have a farm. Yeah. We still have horses here. We do, unfortunately. No. <laughs> yeah. They're pretty much a part of this place, I think, as long as our daughter's here. So. Yeah. We have three little ponies. We have three horses. We have one that's kind of retired. No, four horses. Ali, Taco, Phoebe. Phoebe's yeah. got a great story. We saved her a couple, almost a decade ago, I guess. Right. Yeah. That was a rescue thing. That was something rescue. I never knew about that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, with the animals, you could rescue like a dog. I didn't know that these horse rescues existed the way that they do. And yeah. Phoebe was a super athletic horse that two of your friends from different parts of the country were like, hey, mm -hmm. because horse people are a little little wild. For Crazy. some reason, they look at horses as if they're going to buy one. 
and they just see what's out there on the market, but they never actually, it's like window shopping with horses. Two friends sent you the message that, hey, you should check this horse out because of the bloodline thing. No, right? and, and just her, the way she moved. Yeah, I mean, she's great. She's very athletic. Yeah, she's very athletic. She, the first couple months, I think she she jumped over that golf cart we had here. She we were did. doing work behind our barn and we were uh, like, there's no way that she'll be able to come up here and get nosy and whatever. We have a side by side with like a dump just to give people an idea of what side it looks like. Side? Yeah, that's what they're called. What? The what, golf cart? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we put the <laughs> golf cart in the path, thinking it blocked the old path, but then she somehow she jumped the with bed. us. We didn't see that act actually occur. At least I didn't. But uh, anyway, Yeah. that was that. So yeah. horse world, 22 years. So, a little something goes Well, down. longer than that. Sorry. Lee, I coached for 22. Been no, in the game. horse world for 41 40. years. 41 years. Now, that's a lot of years. That's a lot of years. But, uh. The transition occurred. And when Emmy was in the hospital. 2019. 2019. Yeah, 2019. Rough year. That was our fucking pandemic. Oh, I cur I will try not to curse again. Explicit, <laughs> uh, explicit content. Not safe for your children's ears. Anyway, so 2019 happens. Six yeah. months. We have a. You're. You're. Uh, I don't know when it began. I do when that fish lack or daughter's sick. I remember being in Bloomsburg a few times. Mm -hmm, that was Fevers. March and April. That was right before she was. Marissa was running these horse shows in Bloomsburg. Mm -hmm. um, Emmy was getting fevers. One fever. Bleeding? Not uh, the week the the week prior. It was March twenty fourth. I don't remember, remember the dates. It was two weeks prior. She had some. She had diarrhea and like blood in her and some blood in her stool. Had something yeah. called a fistula, which is, uh, I just describe it as an abscess that doesn't close. It was like a That's small what it was. cavernous hole that kind of just went through her Continued. privates and out her rectum to to perianal area, or whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there was like, so that's going on. She has this wound, literally an open wound for months until we got answers. Yeah, well, it started with an abscess. Abscess so opens. Start, yeah, am I allowed to say like? Am I allowed to like go back? Are you gonna edit this? I'm not editing anything, but we're going in the nutshell with. I mean, it started with vaccine reactions to DTaP, and then HSP. Right. So she had diagnosis. multiple reactions, and we kiboshed it after the third time when she had a neurologic reaction. Which, remember that day, she like wouldn't make eye contact with us, talk, noise, nothing. Yes. That was scary. Um. And so I think like she just was, she was chronically inflamed and we just didn't know because oh, yeah. she was thriving. So every time we brought up like, well, this seems off, everyone was like, oh, well, she's really, she's hundred percentile for height and weight and, and developmentally appropriate. So she's fine. Well, that, that brought up a frustrating point because I mean, unfortunately, I don't think the doctors are equipped to handle these like special circumstances, yeah. these special cases. Well, she I mean, was happy. I mean, she like in, until I mean until it like really c came to a head. She was happy. You know, it's not like it wasn't until March, April that she like then was in pain, and there was now there were like there was more to it. Yeah, and yeah. Um, she was very chubby, but then started leveling off with her body weight, and then actually maybe yeah. saw a slight dip eventually, which led she stopped growing. So during she stopped this whole growing time, in height. But during this whole time, too, just to kind yeah. of sum it up, is like she had the fish that we talked about. She was having periodic fever. She had what they diagnosed as HSP, but we don't know she just what the once. cause was. But they, um, her inflammation in her body when they finally did the blood work was, you know, 100 something, and that number should be under 10. It was wild. So the C reactive protein was like 113, 116, something like that. It should be like it eight was or 127. Nine, right? Yeah. Shouldn't be under, it should, be, it should like, be under nine. It should be under nine. Mm. So her body was just totally inflamed and her body was reacting to things in ways that uh, some of the doctors were almost viewing it as like isolated incidents. You know, the fistula, the HSP, the fever. But I, in our mind, and I think eventually the doctor's mind, it just all stemmed from the inflammation situation. Yeah, it was a brewing of inflammation that, that turned on and never turned off. So it's five days in the hospital, right? She had a that was June. Iron transfusion, a blood transfusion. She had blood transfusion too. Yeah. They're slowly figuring out that maybe it's what they called very early onset inflammatory bowel disease. Yeah, very early onset IBD, which is what they were hoping to conclusively diagnose with a bazillion 
tests that they did. But even after the endoscopy was not conclusive. Yeah, blood transfusion, iron transfusion, all that stuff mm -hmm. didn't fix it. Well, they didn't, they didn't she was anemic. They were hoping. She, well, because they, they had to do the blood. The damage. blood transfusion was because she was because her anemia had dipped to a level that she needed a blood transfusion because and she was internally bleeding. Then we're at the hospital. Uh, what's going on? Everything presented itself as if I think, if I remember the packet correctly, as if it was ulcerative colitis. But then they're like, "Yeah, but we're thinking it's no." Did they tell us it was Crohn's or Boston? That was Boston. Anyway, they, they just said early onset IBD, which yeah. which actually does not like delineate one or the other in children because it presents very differently in kids. Yeah. Pediatric, yeah. But they wanted to start her on high risk drugs, even though there was a non conclusive after the hospital endoscope when we were in Lehigh Valley. All right. So yeah. they wanted to start something. We ended up choosing to go with like just a prednisone, right? No, I said, so what happened was we're in a room full of the surgeons, Child Protective Services, and us, and they wanted to start her on biologics. And because of my own autoimmune history, I was fam very familiar with the drugs. So I said, well, if we're, if we're, if we're going with the idea that she has this inflammatory disease and she hasn't been treated with anything, can we, like, my answer is no to the biologics. Can we start with, like, steroids? She hasn't been given anything. I was like, can we start with a 1 instead of a 10? Which, in that moment, nobody responded to. They basically were like, well, we'll go talk about it. And then we went back to the room with Emmy. They went, I guess, to chat. And then they came in, like, no, like, they came in with, that's when they tapped her up to some I new IVs. And then started her on, actually, a, an antibiotic cocktail. And uh, like a broad spectrum, and then also a GI specific, and uh, steroids. And yeah. I, some of the doctors that we met, some of the surgeons, the specialists, they were very good because they were a little bit problem solving based, where mm -hmm. they were able to entertain multiple ideas um, instead of just kind of having their mind made up. And we did experience that with some people along the path that yes. some didn't want to like really have an open view or even really listen to any kind of thought or suggestion that we might have which was annoying and, and frustrating. But um, yeah, there's like still, even it as Emmy got older, it was like, you know, some, some people are like, um, they're able to just entertain multiple ideas at once. All right. And then they whittle it down into whatever they think the best case scenario is. But they understand that it's like a problem solving situation. It's not like a yes or no. It's not a binary. It's this or that. It was, it was like fluid because yeah. The assumption was this fissure that she had was super deep and yada, yada, yada. Then they look at it and it was superficial. It was on the surface. So it was like that, that led to like a, huh. And the surgeon was like, that's interesting. You know, he was kind of blown back. So when we were able to get that treatment, like even the idea was this. She had two. She ended up having two when they went. To, so they did an exploratory surgery when she was admitted to the hospital. Then that and they found this. that she had two and that they were fairly superficial. Um, so if you get the inflammation down... Maybe her body will start to heal itself, which was the route that we were hoping for. And, and which is why that leaving there, say, with like a steroid instead of going full bore 10 mode, like you wanted to start with a one. Well, they was... still wanted us to start. They wanted us to get her on medications, but they entertained start get, starting with a steroid and seeing if that would stabilize her, which it did. We didn't even and, finish that. Right. And right. And we were able to get her off it quickly um, because she was... Because her blood, they, so she was getting blood work done on the regular, and it was starting to trend in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, and she was stabilized. She was eating. She was comfortable. She wasn't actively bleeding. So, and like, um, really like the anemia, like they were looking for the bleeding. So that was staying stable. Inflammatory markers came down a little bit. So we went to Boston Children's for a second opinion, really, at the end of that story. So, um... And yeah, Lehigh Valley was great as far as, well, Dr. Rellis was our surgeon. He was the one that was really out of the box thinking. And so was um, Dr. Zinn, who was a hem the hematologist. Fantastic. They really were like, let's explore all the options. He dove into like different diseases and stuff, like well, infectious even, disease. and. But even like, uh, just to name some doctors, I guess, like we, we were at the, we had to go to the Children's Cancer wing we were in hemong work yeah every four weeks and um there's a dr chum in there and there was like a clerical mistake with what test should be done or something like that but anyway we had to go there two days in a row and we didn't really know him at all but he saw us in there twice and he thought that maybe something bad occurred and he just like 
randomly popped in on his crazy chaotic day, probably just to see if everything was okay because he saw us there two days in a yeah. row and thought we got a bad test result or something. But uh, yeah, yeah that, they it, were, was, it was tough. It to was be. a good team. It was a tough process. I mean, those doctors have. I don't know if a job can be tougher. To, you know, to work yeah, with that, that age group. Yeah, yeah, very that's hard. hard. Um, but For then, sure. like the the idea behind like um, fighting for things is being an advocate. Part, partly, partly your background is, you know, you you mentioned that you had some autoimmune stuff too. But I think if you don't have some of these life experiences, and if you don't realize, like, hey, I could be that you know one out of a hundred person mm -hmm. because a lot of the stuff that we saw was like it always just is geared towards the the greater good which is annoying to hear because what about everybody else and like we, at that moment for us we were one of those other else's and we didn't fit like everything just wasn't all perfect and we had these little things going on and because it didn't fit into like you know a specific uh category mm -hmm. then it was almost as if like we just had to deal with it and it was annoying because it wasn't just easy to get to solutions sometimes. Like if we didn't seek, if you didn't seek it out primarily, then what, you know? Well, right. And your then life our, experiences, I think. Then our daughter would be on biologics, which are really high risk drugs. I mean, but they carry the risk of kidney failure, heart failure. Yeah, those, those side effects failure, are much worse than any, cancer. than any pandemic that we saw. Like those drugs. But they advertise the shit out of them on those television. Those drugs are, you're cursing again. Sorry. Yeah. But so yeah, that was, that was an eye opening thing to see is like, I remember what those side effects were and then we learn of people freaking out on side effects of other stuff. And I was like, wait a second. At the time though, to be fair, I mean, I hope we can have it on this conversation here. Like you were a little bit upset that I said no, because you didn't have a full understanding of those drugs in that moment. And you just wanted, Chris just wanted our daughter to feel better. Like you, I remember you saying that I just don't, you asked me, don't you just want her to get better? And I said, I do, but not this, not, this is not going to, this is not the way. Yeah, I knew nothing. And, totally and really, ignorant. if there like, was two of us that were ignorant to that, I mean, I mean, what are you? Right, just that's what I'm sharing. Is that there's, no there's yeah. the, like that's a normal response for a parent, right? You're in a you're like in a crisis situation, in a room full of what we deem as the authorities on the knowledge, and they recommend something, and oftentimes we kind of just go along with that recommendation because we trust it, without having the full information. Like they gave us actual information about the risks involved and the increased cancer risk and literally said to us, well, the cancer risk is real, but it, but it is on the small side. And I'm like, the fact that you have to give me this paper and I have to sign on it means that it's actually not just on the small side, you know, like the way, like the way it's presented is just, but because in their mind, I think they're, they're so trained to look at things statistically and, um, you know, like I had a conversation with Cassie, like I did a live with a, a friend who's a nurse and um, we just talked about like advocacy. Like you, I think that a lot of people don't realize you can advocate for yourself and for your kids. And it gets tricky with your kids. Like it can, it can be tricky with your kids because they pressure you and like um, in critical situations, you know, sometimes they threaten you with things like child protective services and whatnot and to push a certain direction so it can get really it can get tricky and uncomfortable but i like always share with people that it's okay mm -hmm. to ask questions and if you ever have a physician that doesn't want to answer them you should find a new one um and we thankfully that's what we did actually we had we went to a specialist at chop and when i asked questions this is before Amy was hospitalized um she got rude like, and my question, first of all, you get to ask whatever questions you want, but my questions were pretty fair. Like, well, what are, what are the risks that go along with this route you want to take? And, um, you know, she wanted to have, Emmy was going to have to be under anesthesia for some tests she wanted to run. And I was like, okay, what's the risk involved with that? What's the risk involved with the endoscopy? And she really didn't even actually answer me. She said, well, of course there's risks involved, but we've never experienced them here in our hospital. And I was like, and our daughter will not be your first. Like, I'm not okay with that answer. So... Lehigh Valley was great. They they answered questions and were honest when they didn't have answers. So they were very willing to work with Boston Children's, who ha like has a specialty in that area. Yeah. And Dr. Wahed was phenomenal. Boston's a great city too. So yeah, we like Boston. What am I taking? I mean, I wish you weren't there at the hospital, so, but um, we do like the with, city. <laughs> oh man, I had something here too. I, I wanted you to finish. Oh, it's um. So, we ended up going a holistic route. So. With permission from the physician. Correct. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, Marisa just did a bunch of research, right? She she figured it out, and I wanted to talk about the advocacy side of things. We had to then Emmy when she was older. I mean, I don't want to keep talking about her because uh, there's other stuff to discuss here in her health. But like, she had some issues with a croup, and uh, we met um, an emergency room doctor before, and he was just like, you know, there's there's parents in here that are just they're just so more well versed on these things than I am. He's like, we're here to treat like all of the craziness that occurs. But when there's these crazy circumstances, he was just very open and honest. Like, we aren't as well prepared to handle these things. Parents mm -hmm. have been studying them for months, maybe years. He's like, I haven't looked at this stuff in, in years, probably. Yeah. So he tried to be as well versed as possible and did like, you know, holistic certifications and stayed on top of medical, I don't know, just treatment in general. I think he was trying to stay at well, the, uh, I don't wanna say cutting edge, but more- uh, He was more integrative. Open-minded. He was integrative minded. Yeah. And that came up because he looked at Emmy's chart and asked about it. He asked about her history. And then he asked um, why we went to Boston. Yeah. And I shared my experience at CHOP. And I said I was immediately out. So I started researching, like, who the top specialists in the country were for early onset IBD, which is actually very incredibly rare. Um, very rare. And at the time, there were only 29 specialists in the entire country for it. And Boston Children's had three. Um, so I shared with him my experience and I was like, you know, I was done. Like if I can't ask questions and he laughed and he said, Oh, I wonder how that one, he's like, that's not usually the response. He's like, you don't hear too many people that, that like turn away from CHOP because CHOP is a renowned children's hospital also. And then he said, it, you know, parents, like for me, he's like, I'm more used to parents pushing back because I'm an ER doctor. He's like, but doctors in those specialties aren't. And he's like, for me, I, I default to the parent who knows a lot more about their child than I do in this emergent case. Like I'm not in a specialty. They know more about their kid's specialty than I do, which is interesting. Right. All right so let's go with the why, why that route? I mean, you had a lifetime of not feeling well. Why what right? route? Like not accepting that you're going to be on a medication for the entirety of your life. Oh, because I, cause I, cause I didn't find it acceptable. No, no, I'm, so, I'm going to talk about you now. I don't yeah, want to talk about him anymore. Me. Yeah. Yeah, your childhood. You had issues with what? Oh, everything. I had like asthma, bronchitis all the time, um, mostly up, mostly upper respiratory, upper respiratory stuff, strep throat, GI distress. GI distress was probably stress related. I mean, I think a lot of things were stress related. And then, um, I mean, croup. I had croup as a kid too. I was yeah. in the hospital a bunch with croup as kids. So a lot your, of upper... I feel like your mom has mentioned one of your brothers had some stuff too. Uh, was up at night. Uh, David you know, was colicky. Colicky. Mm -hmm. You know, well, you know what? That just that happens, I guess, when you're a parent, right? Kids are gonna get sick at some point. Yeah. But in your family, though, there's autoimmune stuff, right? Yes. You have some some relatives that have some things. Yeah. You were having these mental. Um, one, I think you were inflamed. Right? Oh, yeah. So if we're going into adulthood. Like 12 to 15 years ago now. Yeah. You know, so she had a child. And looking back in hindsight, it's like, hey, this stuff was going on, I think, maybe a little earlier than I f at first thought. But then in I always thought I had poison ivy. Like I, Just because you were itchy or what? No, I would actually break out in rashes yes. that looked like poison ivy. So we, like, as a child, we it was always treated as poison ivy. But then, um, so it was like a cascade of stuff that happened as an adult. And I don't even remember the full extent. I remember going to Aruba and breaking out down there and then ending up coming home, putting, I was, I mean, I've experienced steroids so many times in my life being put on steroids for the rash that the doctor was like, you know, the sun exposure probably may, exacerbated it. And then, um, what really it, like everything went haywire after that. Cause I was, that was like a three week course of, of steroids. And when I started coming off of them, there obviously was autoimmune stuff going on that I just was my normal. So many things were my normal. Like I couldn't open a water bottle in the morning. And I used to like... Why? My hands were too weak. Weak or puffy or what? Weak. Like weak. I did not have the strength to open so a you water bottle. Grip. You had swell, swelling in the, in the joints too, right? I mean, I've always had swelling in my lower... Yeah. In my, yeah. yeah. Like well, I broke my back when I think I was 29 or 30 and... Um, the orthopedic was asked if I'd ever had back problems previously. And I was like, no one, why? And it's like, your back is like the back of a 55 year old. There's a lot of like arthritis and stuff in there. And I was like, that's weird. No. And then never it turned into a conversation. Isn't that weird though? So like, here's a scenario where there is a specialist who's like, this isn't normal. You know, how have you not been having back pain? 
um, but then it doesn't go anywhere. And I think that's just because like we don't have an integrated medical culture here, right? So it's like special, plus you didn't, specialty, specialty, at specialty. That moment no in your life, you weren't, you weren't pushing for anything. You're like, oh. No. If somebody told me that, that <laughs> I had the knees of a 60 year old, I'd be like, oh, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, that's. I still keep doing what I'm doing. That's kind of I exactly what my response was. I was like, yeah. yeah, no. I didn't have any back problems prior to, to breaking it. <laughs> so then, just so, keeping it moving, then we had the autoimmune stuff going on. Your yeah. Whole, you have a lifetime of this. So I had a stuff. massive flare happen after that steroids, and that's when, like, everything went really haywire. Like, ner like I'd obviously had neurological stuff going on before that I thought was just my, was just normal because it was like my everyday, but it became like I was losing the ability to speak and um, my vision, my vision is something that has gone in and out actually since I was a teenager, but got worse. It would like come and go. Then you went to New York, saw some specialists, right? Yep. What and did they, what did they, what were they leaning towards? Well, first before that, first the lean was MS and then it was not because of all these other symptoms and blood work. Um, but then it, the, they were leaning towards a neurological form of lupus. So MPSLE. Which led you to do what then? What was your first step? Well, I'm thinking about that book, but I don't my know first, if that's your first that step. That was my not. first step. Yeah, yeah. So go with it. So if you don't mind anyway. No. Well, really it was because I, they, because of the prescriptions. So it was a lot of, again, high risk drugs. Um, I'm just one of those people that wants to know why, it, like in general, in life, like with all things, you know, like something intrigues my brain. I want to learn more about it. Um, I like diving into stuff. So when, like all this stuff is happening to my body, but nobody could tell me why. Like, okay, you labeled it, but what is, it didn't tell me anything. And when I would ask why or what's cause, like what's the cause, there was no answer. And so I was like, well, if you can't tell me what's actually wrong with me, I don't want to take drugs that could ultimately kill me. Like, so, um, so I ended up researching uh, really bought this book. The, it's on our shelf back here. The Immune System Recovery Plan. I tell people that book like saved my life because I really believe it did. Um, and from that book, I learned so much. And there was so much in that book that was like symptoms I've had my whole life that I used to like share sometimes. And it would make me feel crazy because people would look at me like I was crazy. Like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, oh my God, I would say that like having like a, like a, like feeling hung over, but not having ever had a drink. You know, I used to have that feeling often. I think a lot of people relate to that now. It's more prevalent. Um, but I would say that sometimes when people be like, all right, that's interesting. But, um, so but that, I started you know, the with elimination, food. right? So there's four main I started four with food. things, right? That, mm -hmm. they, that you cut and you did that. What are they? Let's hear them. Well, it was more than four things. I see so the elimination was, I eliminated four foods a month for like, three to five months, um, four to five months, I think. Um, and what turned out was corn, dairy, gluten, and soy. So, um, just to more triggers. a backdrop, I mean, I've seen Marisa in the fetal position on the floor, like shaking after, this has been a while now, but like yeah. whether it was corn, I always just thought like, oh, there must've been corn or something, but you know, like I've seen that moment. So when people think you're crazy or whatever, it's like, how many people had nights like that where they're like shivering, shaking on the floor of a bathroom? I don't think I've ever had. And I've seen a few of those with Marisa. So to like not take that into consideration sometimes makes me think that you don't take the human into consideration, you know? Mm. Like that's your story. And for people to not just to like play it off is probably a frustrating thing. Like, I think a lot oh, of people you can't eat corn, that. Oh, you know, whatever. You're not going to eat bread and whatever. It's like, well... Have you ever laid on the floor or seen somebody shaking or getting ill? You know, there's people out there that I know feel whatever yeah. symptoms they feel, whether it's like the GI stuff or, you know, they, like the one dude was like, he doesn't, he had like irritable bowel disease. He's like, I, I can't go anywhere if there's not a bathroom close by. So yeah. his entire life. Yeah, it's totally disruptive. Totally kills Quality it because life. Mm -hmm. you don't want to crap your pants, basically. <laughs> and I don't blame him. Yeah. I don't either. Well, it's this right. there's this discomfort piece <clears throat> of it too, you know. Yeah, I think that I think that I think there's actually a lot of people that fall into my category of having things that um are impacting their quality of life and are often told that it's not a big deal or it's in their head or because there's not a specific lab. So like I had stuff leading up to this and I had blood work done and I'd had stuff done. And the only thing that kind of popped on my blood work was my CRP, which was my inflammatory marker, was elevated. 
And the response to that was, well, you know, everything else looks normal. So that could just be a viral exposure, which is true. It can, like, having an infection can, can cause that. There, stress can cause it. There are things that can cause it. But, um, but it was the only thing that stayed consistently there. Um, but because it wasn't severe, it kind of was just not examined deeper, you know? And, it, and really... I remember once, too, and I wanted to bring this up because I think there was two thing, a few things that I learned during this whole process. Obviously, the food part of it all, right? The inflammation stuff. Yeah. I used to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, salt, like those big hard pretzels, uh, sourdoughs. I used to love that. <laughs> I would just eat. I, didn't, I just ate whatever I felt like it. Um, then Marisa's exploring things, and I sweet remember and chicken. reading um, Sweet and Sour Chicken on, that on sour. A Friday night <laughs> over there in Easton, Pennsylvania. But anyway... Um, one thing during that process, obviously the foods could call, actually more than one thing. So the foods could cause this stuff, right? Then I read a book called The Grain Brain that talked about the effect of like glutens and flowers could have on your mind. And it was, they referred to Alzheimer's as type 3 diabetes. I learned this along the way where, all right, so the same foods that are triggering diabetes are also affecting cognitive ability in people. Those that have diabetes are at a much higher rate to develop these things. Maybe that connection is real. And uh, so I'm like, huh, that's scary enough for me. I don't want to lose my mind and I don't want to go down this path of diabetes or like cardiovascular disease. Cut that out. The other thing during this whole blood work thing was that you found, I think your iron levels were low, mm -hmm. but your vitamin D, we learned that relationship between vitamin D and iron was that your body will absorb that iron better if your vitamin D levels kind of got corrected. Oh, my vitamin so D it came was to, low. Yeah, yeah, so it came to, if you fix your vitamin D, your iron got self you didn't have to supplement iron really. I never you, supplemented iron. Right, yeah. you, you fix the vitamin D and then the iron got fixed. Right, because those two are kind of working in relationship well, with one another. So it's not just yeah. So those. But anyway, two, that whole concept. I don't want to go into the submit like the the. No, but there's the details. The of inflammation the too is a factor. Like when you're inflamed, you don't absorb nutrients. Like your your nutrient absorption is decreased. So if you're in an inflamed state, even if you're getting like a nutrient dense diet, if the inflammatory if the inflammation is there, you're absorbing less of the nutrients as well. I wanted to just point out that one thing, you can't isolate one thing and be like, to fix iron, I'm going to take iron. Because that might not have done Correct. it for you because your vitamin D was low. So during that whole process, I started learning that there's some sort of inner relationship going on where certain things support other certain things. And I think that's important to understand because, um, you know, if you want to kind of get to the bottom of stuff, you can't just have this like narrow minded focus and all right, I'm low on iron, I'll take this or this, yeah, whatever. Well, it's not just so food either. Thing. You know, no, that's everything. Like, that's the doctors right. that we talk to. That's what you do with your work, which is what I want to get to, too. That's why I'm, my roundabout circle was the inflammation, the autoimmune. Then we got on Emmy for 20 plus minutes. <laughs> then we started. I wanted to talk about your healing process. And then I want to talk about why you do what you do and what you do now. Well, my healing process started with, with food because it was um, the easiest thing to take control over, I think. And, and I had a guide, right? So in that book, it was, you know, talked about doing the elimination diet. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. Saw re results felt significantly better. I mean, like it's crazy how quickly I started to feel better. So that was rewarding, which allowed me to start, um, really connecting with other areas of my life, like stress and self care and, um, just everything. It's the whole thing. Such a... It's the whole picture. Stress causes inflammation. Stress causes disease. So anyone who's chronically stressed, is in a high risk state. So you're lucky that you met me then. Keep your stress levels. I low. am actually. So um was a good addition. So what do we got? We so are eating just, better. Yeah. We're getting rid of junk and now we're starting to feel better. Who would have thought that if you don't put <laughs> stuff that could potentially poison you in your body, that you would actually start feeling better. Yeah. The inflammation starts to get better. The blood work gets corrected. Mm -hmm. Same with Emmy as, as later down the line. We're we were able to get on a diet with Emmy for her diagnosis because we were already living it. So I was saying about my diet, I just got on board with whatever Marisa was doing. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, that's cool. I feel better. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say there's a direct effect here, but this is 10 years in the making at least, you know, weighing 205 pounds. 100% you lost weight when you shifted your now, diet now to I'm like, Now I'm like, <laughs> anyway, ignore that. Let's just say that I'm probably 20 plus pounds lighter yeah. now. With like the strength levels being the same, and I'm sure my cardiovascular system is just as good. Yeah. Um, and it was just, you know, being mindful of what you eat. I guess daily activity also matters, but yes. at that moment for you, mm -hmm. you were not feeling well. Your job was physically demanding. 
very and physically the food, demanding. The, the food side of things really helps. So we talked about Emmy already, COVID. So Emmy starts going on, we're crazy busy. Horse business is negatively affected by it. So you make a decision yeah. that I'm gonna unload a few horses. I made a decision basically to get out of business. Get yeah. out of business. COVID happens, then it's like, yeah, we're gonna definitely speed up this process. You ended up moving horses out. I already did before COVID. But you had those two periods of time where it's like, Emmy sick, I'm moving horses. COVID happened shortly after that. Yep. Move some more horses. Well, and, what, that, and then what was your next step? Well, what were you gonna do with your life? Well, when you made that decision, I am not doing horses. <laughs> Well, it wasn't like an, I'm not doing horses. I'm done. Was, you just said I shut the business down. Yeah, because it wasn't sustainable. It was like, this is not, a, like, we went maybe like six months trying to make it all work. Well, I went six months trying to make it all work. And um, and then it it just wasn't sustainable. Like, it, we were hitting into the season where we where we used to travel all summer. We would literally travel on the East Coast. And um, that was not doable. So that, like, my clients, you know, they were, my clients were awesome through it all like they were very supportive um but not, it wasn't fair to the clients wasn't fair to the horses so i actually sold most of our horses by the end by december of 2019 so actually right before covid which was a blessing because then covid happened mm. um but backtracking to shut the world down huh yeah well we were like whatever i was I, uh, we really were <laughs> i mean i just cleaned out the barn and moved my gym home we worked out outside for a period of time there's still like 150,000 hours of work to do around here. So um, I don't want to take another year off, but, you know, if around the shut down yeah. for a year, maybe we we could get our farm looking extra nice. <laughs> but yeah, so a, no, let's get back. It was on a task. less crazy what time, actually. Did you say, so, what am I going to do? My name's Marisa. I have a sick kid. Well, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting out of the horse game. I'm done. I knew, I mean, I knew I wanted to be in the space because when we met, I actually was exploring the idea of going to get my doctorate in nat naturopathy in Oregon. Some woo woo so stuff. Something, some, might, some might say. Woo, some might say that. I'm not no, saying that. No, it's I not. Am. It's not. It's. In, in, I'm just it's, saying somebody might say that. It's an actual doctorate program. Hey. Anyway. Tomato, tomato, you know? <laughs> um, so it was already a passion of mine. It's always been an interest. I did nutrition, like a, the nutrition in college too. And. Um, I love, I do love it. I love the integrative health stuff. So when I, when I was feeling better, lots of people were asking me like what I did. And a lot of times I would just share, like, I can only share what I did and the books I read. I read so many books at that point. Um, I used to share that book. We had multiple copies of that book because we would share it with a lot of people. So it kind of just started a little bit on the side, helping people. And then when everything happened with Emmy, I decided to go back to school. That's what I decided to do. But at the same time, I needed to have income and randomly came across, at that time, a nutraceutical company that um, I partnered with so that like I could do it from anywhere. And um, my goal really with that was just to earn some income in a space that aligned with who I am and what I believe in. And really, I joined because the company had a great CBD product. With well, the turmeric as well. Well, I didn't know about that, though. So when I joined, it was really just because of CBD. The research I put into was in the CBD. And then it was while Emmy was in the hospital. So a friend of mine that was also at the company would call and just check check in on us. Like she knew everything that was happening in our world personally and, and also with Em's health. And um, there was a day where, so we decided we were going to do go with curcumin. We, there's a lot of research on curcumin actually being like as effective as some of the anti-TNF drugs they wanted to start. So... Physician approves that. We have to go four weeks for blood work to make sure it's actually doing something. Um, none of the research is in pediatrics, so dosing it was kind of a crapshoot. And uh, we couldn't find one at first. Remember, we got like those soft gels first with yeah. the Bioprene, and I was trying to like cut them and squirt them into Emmy's mouth. And she's 15 months old, guys, and she was like mostly breastfed, like 90% breastfed at that time. She was just starting to like, not like I said, a play with food, eat food. And it, she started, she would cry because it's spicy because there's like, there's black pepper extract in it to make it uh, more absorbable, right? Kind of Better like absorption. A, yeah. Vitamin D and the other yeah. thing. Yeah. So, um, so I was like melting down one day. She's like, you know, we have a product, like our company has a product. And so that turned into actually talking with the formulator and dosing it and having Boston approve it. 
and it was a liquid. It was like a little spray. Yep. We called it the squirts. Yep. Um, and it worked. It worked. And phenomenally well. And we, we added in another product too that really I think um, it again like double whammy the inflammation and helped her heal. Promoted so the healing. We so, have that. I just wanted to say that you went you went back to school and you have a health coaching business right now. I do. And you're working mm -hmm. we're gonna bring it all together, I think, here. I do, um yeah. So who are you working with primarily? Who are the people coming? Are they the people that, you know, are they part of the greater good or are they some of these outliers that have these special circumstances? I think 50% uh, of my clientele and my practice is people with chronic illness and um, re that, that want What's answers. What's the other 50? They want answers. The other 50 is like women, a lot of women in business with families who are maybe coming in with like, there's a health thing that usually brings them in, whether it's like fatigue or a hormonal imbalance, um, you know, perimenopausal stuff or weight gain or weight loss, whatever it is. That's like, maybe it's not as chronic as some of like diabetes, but oftentimes those cases, really all of them are looking at the whole life picture. So it's a lot of life. It's a lot of life coaching and the chronic illness clientele, there's a deeper component to, um, to their program that, that is dealing with nutrition, that's dealing with blood work and labs and but even that, to, just to that point, too, in that the you could, team. like you could write a, a lab, you know, you could get can, blood work done for somebody. I can get and this is the type of blood work sometimes that it, it's kind of a fight that you have to have with your doctor mm -hmm. because of insurance or all this other crap, right? So instead of, you know, some people are just like, I don't want to have this fight with my doctor. I wonder if Marisa could do that. And then Marisa would meet with them. They would spend time together. They would talk about things. They would try to figure out what's the best option yeah. from there coach them kind of through the process, what to look for, things of that nature. I was thinking of our friend, my, my friend's wife, for example, as somebody that you spoke with a bunch and mm -hmm. helped her work out uh, some kinks. Um, but we have that going on. So you wanted to launch that. We found some products that are great for Emmy. And then you found a world of people that, you know. Oh my gosh, incredible. Community. Just the world opened with, uh, I mean, it's basically just an, it's a network marketing type company. The far, the drugs, the drugs. The supplements, we'll say, is, yeah. that, is that the proper terminology? They would, yeah. you describe them as nutraceuticals. I do, just because what in the of, world is a nutraceutical. I don't know. It's a supplement, but it's, you? <laughs> it's a blend. So it's a supplemental blend that's often at a therapeutic dose. Now, like, we can't say we cure, treat, you know, any of those things. But it's all geared towards something. But which, right, it is which, all geared towards something. It's all, and it's all based on research, actual research, like we, you know, we found that research on curcumin and its effectiveness in specifically IBD as a treatment um, equivalent to biologics. So it was, the research is there behind the ingredients. So it's which like, is found pretty an awesome. option. I think this is important too. It's like you found something that might work and then you found a supplement that might work and then you tried it Yeah. and then you tested it. And then you saw that it did work. Cool. We'll keep it. If it doesn't work, you get rid of it. But the key is to like keep trying. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like you have to just kind of be the advocate, like we we mentioned, and keep going towards finding the solution and have some sort of problem solving mindset to these. Well, that's the thing. To these things. Too. Everybody's so bio individual. Like what worked for me isn't necessarily going to work yeah. for somebody else. And and I don't want to say that food is necessarily the cause. It's just I think the trigger in an already disrupted body. You know, I think my cause probably stems back to some childhood stuff um, and then chronic stress in my adult life and crazy stuff that happened in my life. Those things like really tax your immune system. Well, there's a, I mean, I've brought, and then there's toxic exposure. I, some people experience that piece in yeah. their work or, you know, or even where they live. If they're in, a, in an area that's heavily sprayed, that toxic exposure can really cause disruption. And food can do it too, for sure. It can be the cause depending on what it is. Like if you're eating McDonald's every day. And I, I just wanted to bring up that, you know, that four pillars thing that I seem to always circle back to. But it's like the environmental stuff is like a physical issue. It affects you physically. Which affects you mentally and spiritually, too. Right. So yeah. you have the mental component where it's like you need mental health is one of the pillars. Physical health is a pillar. Um, social health is a pillar. Spiritual health is a pillar. It's you, you cannot negate or ignore any of those little areas. And if you do, 
you're probably not functioning optimally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the mental side of things, if you have this, whatever it is, childhood trauma, or you're in a relationship where the person's mean to you, or they don't let, they don't give you an opportunity to talk, to speak your mind, whatever, that's a mental trauma, that's a mental issue, that's a mental disruption, I guess. Which becomes physical disruption. Right. Which becomes social and spiritual disruption. I mean, so they all like, like the go, nine hour work, or they all go together, hours, it's a cycle. You know, if you're, you know, the, the workouts, the, the diet, whatever. Yeah. If you have all that stuff in check, but you're still mi 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 missing that bucket, that's a problem. Now, you know, technology, uh, work with kids, you see kids, you see adults on the phones, not getting face to face. Mm -hmm. People might be struggling a little bit socially there. That's one bucket of potential problems that we might be seeing down the line here. Mm -hmm. And then there's a spiritual component where, I don't know. Disconnection. Yeah, I just try to summarize it. I don't go to church. Marisa thinks I'm some sort of anti-religion advocate. I don't go to church but, uh, either. No, 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 no. But this First is what all, it is. This is how I define spirituality. It's about the. It's about something bigger than oneself. If you could, if you could affect your small little environment, Marisa and I affect each other hopefully positively. Maybe the people that we then go and deal with get affected in a positive way, and then maybe those people could go affect others. And then we we put the big picture in mind. We don't just think about ourselves all the time. We think about others. In our community back in the day the community yeah. was the church probably more it's not that uh, not that way anymore but you know there's all these other little it seems like political groups seem to like fill the void sometimes where people you know find their little people are missing community whatever. yeah so they're searching it out in other ways but uh yeah i just think having the bigger picture in mind is how i how i how i would summarize that but again um what were you gonna say go ahead you got something to say I, there no i was just gonna say it's not i don't think you're a whatever anti whatever you said yeah, not as um, Christopher just couldn't mm -hmm. even say the word spiritual until a few months ago so I'm only giving it a try I'm only giving it a try because I read something from 2013 in India and I'm like you know what and spirituality really has nothing to do with religion spirituality is just like your connection to something more something more yeah which brings us back to, to the American to... Indian I'm just kidding oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't want to circle it all the way back this is what we have here. We have had, you've had a life of not feeling great. You kept fighting. You're an advocate for yourself. You're an advocate for your family. Um, that's a great thing. Thank you. Now you're trying to incorporate that with your health coaching. And then also now we both, I just kind of started helping after four years of saying, get away from me. <laughs> I kind of assist. I'd say I'm more assist. Like if you saw the office, I'm not assistant coach. I'm like assistant to the coach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to help her out in any way possible um, to build a large network of people of like-minded focus, which is kind of what this company does. Yeah. I think I have a shirt on, actually, right now. No, but, you have a Virginia Tech sweatshirt on, but I have a three shirt on. Yeah, I have that one on. But anyway, yeah. um, and that's a cool company. It's called Three, um, and we met a lot of awesome people, which makes it nice. You travel around the country, and you, you know that there's people that you know, like, not too far away. Um, you've made tons of connections. Yeah, so many, um, hundreds, so many amazing hundreds. connections. So it's cool. So I was like, you know what? Instead of fighting that and being like, I don't want to align with this and that, it's this or, you know, whatever. I just said, screw it. Well, I mean, you've been taking the products also. True. Like he uses them all the time. I just, do take them. But just doesn't share share about them. And honestly, I used to be anti-supplement. I mean, I, yeah, like me you too. do that. Me like, too. I don't, I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to. Some people have these crazy testimonials, but I never had it. I never experienced a crazy testimonial where I just a light switch. But you just shared about your ankle. That's a little thing, though. That's that not I, a little I, thing. I wasn't in debilitating pain. Every morning I would wake up and my heel and ankle would be stiff and tight. You would talk and it would be about hurt, it, and it every bend. day. I know for over a year. I haven't, had it. <laughs> I haven't had it in a while, but it wasn't like an earth shattering thing where it's like I'm limping. It was like in the morning for 25 minutes, and then once I got my body moving, it would go away. So it wasn't something that was with me all day. It wasn't like knee pain all day and then I took something But it bothered else. you every day and you talked about it every day and it bothered you enough that you were always thinking about it. No, it just yeah. in the moment because it got better. It went away once I got moving. But I've noticed that it hasn't been happening. That's a testimonial. I hope so. That's the problem with things like with lifestyle shifts and potentially supplemental is that, you know, when you start to feel better, you do better and you don't always connect the dots. You know, a lot of people, it, it goes in the reverse too. A lot of people don't connect the dots to I ate this and now I feel tired. Like, it's almost been normalized that you feel tired after a meal and that's actually not normal. So I think that like our, there, it comes back to being disconnected. I think that connection is like a really important piece of 
the health and healing puzzle, like connection to yourself, connection to others, connection to a higher energy. I think that when there's full disconnection, then there's often a lot of illness, mental, physical, social. And all of those things too are like, most things are multifactorial. At least that's how my mind works. Mm -hmm. I don't think Everything. it's a binary yes, no. So to be like, I took this and I feel better. I, I don't really do that because I look at like multiple factors mm -hmm. and that's just one piece of the puzzle that I've been trying to do to be better about. Right. So, um, I think what sold us was that, I mean, for me, I was anti supplement because there's, there's no regulation on them and there's so many. So it was overwhelming for me to tackle that piece, even yeah. though it was recommended in all the books I read, it was recommended everywhere. Um, but then with Emmy, like we were forced to look back at that option because it was not, we couldn't shift the lifestyle of our 15 month old. Yeah. Like we already eliminated everything. My breast milk already didn't have dairy. We eat all things. So. And I always think too, with, we have friends too. We were too forced to look deeper. They use some supplements. And even with our daughter, it's like, you can't really have the placebo effect because they're, yeah. too, they're young for that. Right. You can say, Oh, it's a vitamin. It's going to make you feel better. But I don't know if that, I don't know. Yeah, so... Well, for her, it was, was like that tremendous shift kind of, of blood work. Even a friend that has, like, you know, child has some... Their skin cleared up from eczema, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it wasn't perfect. It's still there, but it got a hundred times better. better. Yeah. So it's like, what do you what do you make of that? It's You introduce something, it helps somebody out. You can't say it cures anything, but it obviously was one piece to the many... The multifactorial puzzle that seemed to fit in perfectly to really, make it's it work. It's know? about so, providing your body with the tools to actually do what it like the body's meant to heal like if you get a cut it heals right if you get a cut and it doesn't heal there's something wrong and going on in your body so it's like giving your body the tools so that it can actually do what it's meant to do and i think it's also having the mindset of like i am going to heal my parents want me to heal not not mask it not cover it up with something it's like yeah our goal is to heal yeah and not um just take something that makes it go away for the day and then i have to take it again the next day you know it's like we're all on this thing together. We're going to have a mindset of feeling and we're going to have a mindset of feeling better and a mindset of solving this crack in the code, right? And Yeah, and there's to energy to that. Yeah, probably, right? Yeah. And yeah, it's like that feel, even if you're feeling, even having that mindset shift of like, well, I'll just take this to like, I'm actively doing it. I'm doing it. You know, there's some resiliency in there. It's not like, there's like, my work is going to, mm -hmm. X leads to Y and then Y will lead to Z, right? Yeah. And if you don't do those steps, you're not going to get to Z, I guess. Yeah. It's like you, you're taking... You're taking control. Yeah, it's all about it's all about taking ownership, really. You got anything for me? Yeah, wrap this up. <laughs> I thought I wasn't allowed to ask questions. That's what you told me when I get, before we came on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you ask one, and I gave myself the option to take one hard pass. So choose wisely. Um, if not, we're good to go. Oh, this is what we do. We have events at our house, right? Yeah, yeah. We have some wellness networking events. Mm -hmm. This is like the time if I was like uh, doing. Uh, concert or something we could announce our gigs basically what we do i have the fit i have a gym i work primarily with kids marisa's doing health coaching and she works that business a lot more than i do but what we're trying to do here is trying to offer some different components to things i do fitness stuff marisa does a lot more of that uh out of the gym type of healing and you know just what you put in your body the mental side of things, integrated that. functional health i don't have those conversations with people too too often but then we found this other thing that's kind of like the the bridge it's it's a a compliment to to what we're doing and we host some events we'll call i don't even know what, what to call them but they're just kind of like health and wellness proactive wellness ne ne proactive wellness like networking type event where we just get a bunch of people together we talk about what we're doing we share what we're doing we usually eat some food we eat food. Good food we have a friend bringing some teas over on monday yeah which is cool joyce so is bringing foods monday night 6 p.m but if not we will at least probably once a month we're gonna have one on the property somewhere so and then we have friends that are doing them in the area if interested, yeah, we I'm really our goal with that is to really contribute to community and build build a healthy community in all the areas, mind, yeah. body, spirit. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think uh, one guy would refer to it as like an intentional community where it's like it's not just like the people that are around you. You don't really choose who lives around you, but we're being intentional with what the with the work that we're doing, and you know we are being intentional about the people that we want to have in our lives as well. Yeah, and. uh and connecting other people that we think, yeah. like, you know, I'm excited about a couple of people that are coming over on Monday because I want to connect them together. I think they could do cool stuff together. So. All right.
Well, there you go. You lost your question op uh, opportunity. You took it over. You didn't, you didn't want a question. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Guest and friends. You, guest number one. You heard it here. Guest number one and number one friend. Yeah. I've never heard that before. Never. I never said it. No, That's I true. know. Peace, everybody. Bye.